that was almost caught up in the things you do for now. So you just might smile at me, but for love's sake. I do not think the to welcome you to this lecture, this public lecture, here at the same university, um, which has been arranged all together by the Center for Peace Study, our chapters. Lectures are a form of instruction, or they are a form of um, knowledge dissemination, which is different from a summon. Um, which narration or even a message go follows from them all. Um, but these are critical elements in the life of the university as they provide a very important role for community engagement. All the times universities are engaged directly with students to the church. But this is an opportunity that we get to interrupt and have lively discussions with the people we live with, the community that surrounds us. How do you trust now in that same place for foster a love of learning, a greater understanding of our students and the world around us? We can help students. Employers, community, engage effectively as members of a global community, while supporting them as individuals, the global community members of the country. And the university will take great pride in conducting this public lecture. We actually have other public lectures as well on the main campus. But this is an innovative one as a lower campus, and we really like to acknowledge it for the study and the team for um, starting this event. We involve with the annual where we get to engage with our communities. You know, as a university, we want to teach them and um, doing research. We are expected to engage with our communities. And it is a big role at the university, especially at the MPU, we try to take pride in being cultivators of the current world with a Christian worldview. We want to be able to affect, influence our community in terms of study and also distinguish leadership in a few challenging times. Today's theme is a reconciliation, paving the way for harmony and prosperity to be before we said. Very much reflects what we desire to do, but also it very much reflects the heart of Christ. Christ's ministry is all about reconciliation, and he charged us to be also reconciliators wherever we are. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 20 says that we are Christ and Dr. Dad. We are Christ. How can we, as something or victims who violently learn how to build trust or live cooperatively or in stable peace? These are the things that. We need to explore at different levels, at individual, at community, local, international level. Father, question to ask the problem as you are in this meeting. How can we tap into God's mercy deepness? To be able to reconcile with one another, reconcile with our neighbors. We look forward to a very engaging discourse. This afternoon, in exploring this dream to be able to solve it by a beloved guest speaker, who is the right of the professor Alfred Oloa, the bishop of the Diocese of Lamo here in Uganda, 
and finally she came in with the bishop of the diocese of Nauru. He was the dean of an evangelical American theological college in Nkono. He is also active in the global American fiction movement, that one. In fact, he doctor research work in the doctrine of reconciliation, in the preaching of Bishop Peter Chibere of Uganda. This was awarded in 2012 and published by London Monographs in 2013. We could not, we could not have got a better now. We don't seek out for these events. Um, he has taught in the areas of preaching and historical theology, with particular rich research interest in the mission and the evangelism doctrines, histology, and Uganda church history. He continues to write in the area of church history in East Africa, Pentecostal and charismatic theology, reconciliation, and particularly that of the Sophie he is the author of a monograph in the London series entitled Missionary Reconciliation, the role in the doctrine of reconciliation in In recent years, we have written a number of journal articles and book chapters. He is currently engaged in writing more substantially in peace building and the consideration in Canada. With a big juncture that I would like to ask you to go be welcome with me, the right to write Professor Alfred Ola to give us his view of that. Thank you. I will bring you greetings, your brother and sister, Lago. My students are ably represented here by Professor Elizabeth, Director of Arua Campus. And of course, the chief discussion today, Dr. Milton Puto, the whole protocol of Zad. In the interest of time, particularly for those who are following me online, I will go straight to address myself the topic which I have radically changed to transcribe the future generations. First, for a contextual practical theological approach, last two weeks forgiveness and reconciliation. As a low title, but it captures very much what was the first title. And by way of introduction, let me give you the map what I'd like to speak about. For you to get a good grip on our topic, transferring deep person movements, future generations, in search of the contextual practical spiritual approach, lasting peace, through forgiveness and reconciliation. We start with clarifying the term deep. Frozen wounds. 
Then he poses two more basic questions. What? Who? How? And when? Which I then make a few remarks before making a conclusion appealing for the establishment of a center for peace building and reconciliation at St. Paul's Brinkley at our Palms. Fly find the town, deep frozen wounds. The town deep frozen wounds in this public lecture will be used as a metaphor. Expressing and conveying a sense of unresolved emotional pain or trauma that has been buried or suppressed within a person's psyche over an extended period. It suggests that these emotional wounds have been frozen or pushed deep into the subconscious, where they remain unresolved and unhealed, just as the first bite can numb and damage the body, this deep frozen wound can numb the person's emotional well-being, hindering their ability to heal and move forward. Life. We shall take that the wounds have originated from various sources, broken relationships at individual, national, international levels, or significant life events in this case, from atrocities, violence, and killings during First Benjamin's rule, Uganda. When we refer to a generation, for an individual, how many deep personal wounds would mean that they have experienced profound emotional pain that they have not yet confronted or processed fully. These unresolved issues are manifested in various ways, including anxiety, depression, anger, self destructive behavior. Addressing deep frozen wounds so that we may not be transferred future generations typically involves self-reflection and a commitment to acknowledging the work through the underlying pain and promise. With that clarification, we now turn the question, what? Question one, what are some of the deep frozen wounds? That may be transferred to the future generations that need a potential, practical, theological approach leading to a lasting peace that is built into the biblical method forgiveness and reconciliation centered in Jesus Christ. It is important to state up front that given the period when President Amin was in power in the 1971-1979, many scholars have written on President Amin's rule, including the report of the Commission of Inquiry into the violation of human rights, findings, conclusions, and recommendations of October 1994. However, it is only fitting and important that for our lecture, we name briefly a timeline of a means of rule, what we know. And the merit in this is that we shall selectively Memorize and state correctly our own story and not leave it to other people outside of the region or within Uganda. Better still, people outside our country may be open to these representing parts of our 
And now we take you on a journey of a timeline, trying to map, locate some of the deep frozen wounds in our history that leads us to see what happened here at Ringling in the mass, the roots. Many Ugandans rejoiced when Amin was toppled. And Amin was becoming increasingly popular as opposed to the Obote government, who was elected at the time, and Obote was a leftist. Amin was not socialist. Amin had charisma. And some of Amin's early political actions, following the coup, which were intended to solidify the legitimate disposition, showed promise for the country's future. For example, people five years earlier had led their assault on the Kavakas compound, forcing the king to exit in England, where he subsequently died, now brought back the Kavakas body. Of value in the home. And before long, our events turned for the worse. So we asked, what? Margaret Ford, author of the book, Journaling The Making of Martha. She was the personal secretary of Archbishop the Womb. And I chose to quote from her accounts extensively. And let me first justify why. Besides being the personal secretary of Archbishop General in the world, Margaret's accounts brings to our attention four points. First is because she was the personal secretary of the who became Anglican Archbishop of Uganda, Wanda Burundi, and Bogasari. And those accounts can be spread in the poster because if you have in-depth knowledge of situation surrounding the official and personal life of Archbishop of Uganda, who immediately will later kill and create key wounds. But also being a Christian, and India being, being a Muslim, Margaret Ford will perhaps have a sympathetic alignment with the Christians in our perspective of this question. Sadly, she's writing in a context not very far removed from the gruesome killings of Amin 